This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. In the name of the one who shines brilliantly, shines brilliantly with uh, his glory and the glory of heaven, dear brothers and sisters. I read an interesting article this week in uh, Smithsonian Magazine. It was called, The Dangers of Winter Darkness. There are some places in our country and in our world that are rather dark at winter time, and this article explored some of the effects of the darkness that it has this time of, of year. Some of you know that uh, sunlight triggers a process in our skin that develops vitamin D. And this article says that vitamin D helps to regulate more than a thousand genes, which in turn affects most of our tissues in our body. And it's also crucial for bone health and to keep your immune system strong. Light sure has an effect on your physical health, but also mental health can suffer if light is deprived. There are places in our country other than ours that uh, get rather dark and, and gloomy and cold this time of year. And there's a disorder called Seasonal Affective Disorder, SAD, SAD, that affects many people. It can be a form of depression. It can bring a loss of appetite. It can bring a lack of interest in activities, oversleeping, and it kind of shows us that we need light. Now, the good news this article says is that SAD can be treated by flooding the body with artificial light. If you do that, it kind of gets your system going again with vitamin D and kind of recalibrates some of your brain chemicals so that you have good effects on your body. We need light. You know, that's not just true physically, though. Today on Transfiguration Sunday, we see that that's true spiritually as well. We need a light. To, to explore this a little bit more in our message today, we're going to take a closer look at that second reading today from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to consider the theme, look, a light. Paul's going to mention that, that light that shined in his life and also that continues to shine now that we truly see on Transfiguration Sunday. Today, let's look at three brief angles in this reading about the light. First of all, let's see the light defined. And then secondly, we'll see Satan makes blind. And then thirdly, but then God shined. As we look at this reading, we read verse 5, first of all, where Paul writes, We do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Paul mainly says here, it's not about me. Now, that might be kind of obvious to you, but back then, it could often be a lot about the speaker. When, when we had a sermon just a few weeks ago on, on Paul's thorn in the flesh, I, I mentioned how speakers were received back in their day. If you came to town as a speaker, even a religious speaker, you might bring your letters of reference. You might bring your credentials, your degrees. You might bring things that backed you up with your message, and it might become a little bit more about the messenger than about the message. You know, sometimes that can happen in churches today as well. Back then also in uh, their Greek world, smooth and skillful oratory was the way to go. Being the silver-tongued one, the one who could say it well, no matter what the message was, that was looked on as a prized gift back in their day and age. It often was about the messenger. But Paul says, the message is not about me. In fact, the message and the true light that we're defining, it was spoken of long before Paul came into the world. There's a verse in Isaiah, Isaiah 9, that says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. 
When did we hear those words? When did we focus on those words? A season ago, at Christmas time, during the darkest time of the year, that's when we celebrate when the light comes into this world. And we heard the angel's message to the shepherds on that dark night, the light of the glory of God shone to them and frightened them very much. We heard about the wise men that followed the light of the star to where the baby boy Jesus was. We also saw the baptism of Jesus where heaven was torn open. Heaven torn open and God the Father spoke much the same words that he speaks in our gospel reading today. We saw the light at the wedding at Cana. Remember how we focused on his first miracle? Jesus revealed his glory, revealed his light just to his inner followers at that time changing water into wine. We've heard about this light in the epiphany season. Epiphany means to, to show forth, to manifest in the authoritative teaching and preaching Jesus did, in the miracles that he did. He showed that he was the light of the world and the fulfillment of that prophecy from Isaiah 9. Jesus is the light and even called himself the light. In John chapter 8, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. More on that later. Jesus in John 12 explained more about his light. He said, You are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of light. Jesus is the light. He is the light defined. And what a welcome sight this is for me and you, because by nature we are not children of light. And we are not children of God. This will be welcome news for sinners. You know, they say that if you live in the absence of light for a long time, that's going to have profound, deep effects on your mental and physical state. In fact, that's often been used as a form of torture in wartime for people who have been captured. If you have that total absence of light, that can even drive a person to the brink of insanity. But that's not the worst darkness that you could ever experience. We are children of spiritual darkness, children not of God, but children of the dark side. And we are children of the dark side who deserve to be thrown away from the presence of our Lord. And when Jesus described what hell is like, he described it a number of times in the gospel, often with a reoccurring phrase. For example, in Matthew 8, where he talked about how the servant de deserved to be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But that's when the light came into the world that we need to see. And that's when on the darkest day, the darkest day that ever was, in the middle of the day on Good Friday, that's when the light of the world gave his life and put out and extinguished his light for you and for me, for our sin, for our guilt, and for the sin of the world so that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. Wonderful news. Wonderful news, except for the fact what, what we see here in the second part of Paul's reading. That should be wonderful news with the light, but then Paul continues, and he says, If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age, that would be Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Sad news. Are you familiar with blackout shades? I'm not talking about just the shades you can pull in your, your house, maybe the ones you pull at night or, or, or flip around. I'm not talking about the ones that just filter the light. I'm talking about blackout shades. You can go to certain stores and buy shades that are certain fabric <coughs> that will not allow any light through. Can you imagine putting up blackout shades throughout your house or your apartment, covering all light coming in? And then can you imagine trying to navigate around on a normal day? It says that Satan would like to install some of these 
on your house. And he has installed them on many people's houses in our world. Again, no new concept. In fact, what is probably the hallmark account in the Bible about someone putting up their blackout shades? We had Moses in the first lesson today. Moses, whose, whose face shone with that glory. If you remember a person Moses encountered who would not believe, who hardened his heart, who would not comply with that little request, let my people go. And you know, Pharaoh of Egypt, despite the plagues that came, the next plague, the next plague, the hail, the, 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 uh, the, the dust, the boils, the darkness, hardened his heart and put up his blackout shades until God finally said to him, in essence, have it your own way. Paul experienced this on his missionary trips as well. If, for example, he came to a, a city called Athens. You probably are very familiar with the, the city name, Athens, Greece. But you know, we don't have a church at Athens. We don't have one ever mentioned in the New Testament. Paul went there in Acts 17 on his second missionary trip. But there's no letter to the Athenians in the New Testament. There's no church at Athens that sprung up. Why was that? It's kind of tragic that in the place that claimed to have the most wisdom, Stoic philosophers, teachers, universities, education and learning, when Paul preached at Mars Hill, people called him a babbler. And then when he brought up the resurrection of the dead, that Jesus rose from the dead, the light of the world rose after he died on the cross. It says they sneered at him. Blackout shades were up in Athens. Paul saw that all around his ministry. Opposition came here. Thrown out of the town over here. Beaten in this town. Imprisoned in this town. The Apostle Paul would stand trial because of his message. And eventually, the darkness would take his life as he lost his life for the sake of the gospel. It, does that sound familiar, perhaps, to some blackout shades that might go up when you bring up what you believe? In our world today, when you bring up the fact that the Bible is the Word of God. It is the inerrant Word of God to be believed and trusted. What will all people say? Or that Jesus is the only way, the only way, truth, and life to salvation. What will some people say? Or that creation is just as the Bible describes in the beginning of the book of Genesis. What will people say? Or that Jesus is surely returning on the last day and he's going to give an accountability to everybody in the mass judgment that will take place then. What will some people say? There will be blinders up. The, the Apostle Paul had those blinders as well early in his life. He was not always the Apostle Paul, if you know your scriptures. He had once been a Pharisee of Pharisees, a persecutor of the church. In fact, Paul once said this about uh, his opposition to the church. He says in Acts 26, I was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. Paul knew about the darkness and the blackout shades that had been in his life as well. And this Lent, Lent begins Wednesday, this Lent we're going to see more darkness and blackout shades. As those enemies of Jesus, they're not going to care what he says or what he teaches or what his claims are. But they're going to reject him and arrest him and they're going to be obsessed in their pursuit of him until that ghastly deed of execution is done. But before we leave the, the blindness, we can't forget somebody. We can't forget you. And we can't forget me. Because we were blind and dead in our sinful condition. We would not choose God if we had the chance before the Holy Spirit came into our lives. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 2, it says, The man without the Spirit does not accept the things 
that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. This was us. Ephesians 2 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. A great parallel verse to this prince of this world that blinds people. Before we had the Holy Spirit enter our lives, we were blind with our blinders on as well. We, we might like to think differently. We might like to think, I, I was just hurt. I, I was just injured a bit. I, I was just wounded. I, I was a little sick, uh, maybe a bit broken. Or maybe we'd even say we were a victim, a victim of circumstances. We were blind and dead in our sins, in our natural condition. But Paul finally tells us the best news. Paul finally tells us about what God did about it in the last verse that says, God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God displayed in the face of Christ. Did you catch the play on words? Did you catch the comparison? There's a comparison here to creation. As surely as God said, let there be light to a place that had no light, could not create its light, was void of light, God looked at you and said, let there be light. And God shined his light, that light of conversion and the light of faith in your heart as well. Again, Paul knew that so well, didn't he? Remember how things changed? In Paul's life? He was at the head of the caravan on the way to Damascus. He was leading the charge to arrest more Christians, to bring them back to Jerusalem, and then God knocked him on his backside with a light. I, I think it would be similar to the light that these disciples saw on that mountain long ago. And Jesus said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? But this just wasn't just the light of the law. This, this was the light that was going to change Paul. Because God knew that he wanted Paul as his child and his preacher. And through baptism and faith, Paul then became a child of the light. And a missionary of that gospel who went to Asia Minor and to Greece and to Rome and perhaps even to Spain. And it was the light that emanated and that was focused on the face. The face of Christ. You know, I, I thought about putting a picture of, of Christ up here today, but I decided not to because we all kind of have our face of Christ that maybe we remember from the past. I don't know which one that you think of, maybe one that your grandma had in the hallway or that your mom had in the kitchen, uh, maybe one with a very serious Jesus and a somber Jesus, maybe one with a smiling Jesus or the Jesus with little children. But I, I just like you to think about that face when the words face of Christ are mentioned because it's a beautiful sight. And it should be for you. It's the face that looked at a woman at a well and shared with her what living water was all about. It was a face that looked at Nicodemus at night and shared the message of why he had come and who he was. It had such an effect on Nicodemus that he would later assist in laying Jesus to rest in the tomb. It was the face that called those 12 disciples. It was the face that looked at that woman who was caught in adultery and said, go and leave your life of sin. It was the face that looked compassionately at lepers. And this Lent, we're going to see in these Lenten readings on Wednesdays, that it would turn and look at Peter after he denied him three times. That's the face of Jesus, the face of grace. And it's the face that has shined on you as well. When you would not choose God, when you loved the darkness and when we were dead in our sins, God shined his light on you and me. John 1 puts it well when it says, To those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, nor of a husband's will, but born of God. And this is the face that will sustain you. See that face in your mind every day. 
when you're weak, when you have sorrow, when you have trials, we fix our eyes on the face of Jesus. Finally today, you may not think that you're going to see that sight that Peter, James, and John did, but our final good news today is you will. You will see the Son of God in his glory. You will see him unveiled. You will see him shining bright with the glory of heaven one day. And you will share his glory as he shares it with you in your eternal heavenly home. A final verse for you from Revelation that describes that light in heaven. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. May God preserve us. May he preserve us in the faith in these dark days that we live through until we see Jesus' light only by his grace and by his redemption, the light he has prepared for you and me. Amen. Please rise.